hi guys welcome back to my channel i hope everyone's doing really really well so today i'm back with another video and today i'm going to be discussing a very old case this case is over 30 years old these cases are just as important as the newer cases and this one especially is very interesting I haven't heard much about this case so I love to do sort of unknown cases because you know they're important and not everyone knows about them and I think it's just good to, to remember these people. So today's case is technically unsolved but it's not really. So I've never seen this done before but in this particular case there is no evidence of a crime actually taking place. But this is the first time that I've actually seen someone be charged with this crime. However, many agencies uh, still consider this individual to be a missing person. So, yeah, it's very confusing, very interesting. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So today we are talking about the mysterious vanishing of Thomas Dean Gibson. Thomas Dean Gibson was born on the 5th of July in 1988. He was born in Azalea, Oregon in the US. He was a two and a half year old boy at the time, so literally still a baby. I couldn't find much on his personality, unfortunately, but by the look of him, he looks really cheeky and a really sweet little boy. He had brown hair, brown eyes with a small scar on his right eyebrow, and he also had a gap in between his front teeth. He was born to his mother, Judith, who was a stay-at-home mum, and his father, Larry Gibson, who was a Douglas County Deputy Sheriff at the time. And they also had a four-year-old daughter, Tommy's sister, named Karen. So for the duration of this video, I'm going to be referring to Thomas as Tommy or Tommy Gibson, because that seemed to be his nickname. In March of 1991, it was a cold and snowy day, and at around 11.30am, little Tommy Gibson was playing in his front garden of his house. His dad, Larry, came out of the house and saw him playing alone, and he called out for his eldest daughter, Karen, to come down and join Tommy and basically play with him, because he was actually on his way out for a jog in the cold weather. As I said, Larry was a deputy sheriff at the time, so he often carried around guns. Um, not all the time, but he obviously was more likely to carry around a gun. So on this particular morning, when he went for his jog, he took a 45 automatic gun, which is quite a small gun, on his jog with him. The reason for this is at the time, the neighbourhood were having quite a big issue with stray cats. I'm not sure why, but this was a different time. I think it's something to do with the stray cats basically compromising their crops and maybe messing up the crops that they're trying to grow. So there was a bit of an issue in the neighbourhood. So that's why Larry decided to take his gun because he did unfortunately shoot stray cats uh, because he saw them as a threat and it was no different this day. As he was on his jog or about to go for his jog, he did see a stray cat and he unfortunately shot the cat, but he said he missed and then he just carried on for his jog. He did try to look for the empty shell casing that came off when he tried to shoot the cat, but he couldn't see it in his immediate proximity, so he just forgot about it and went on for his jog. Judith, Larry's wife, later claimed to have heard the gunshot, and she found it odd because he did like to target practice and stuff like that, but as I said, it wasn't like he took his gun out all the time and she knew he was going for a run. So she found it a bit odd that he just randomly decided to take a gun that day. But she just carried on with what she was doing and she could still hear Tommy playing in the front garden. Larry was on his run for around 45 minutes and when he returned to the family home, he saw his wife Judith in an absolute panic. She was asking, have you seen Tommy? Did he follow you on your jog? Because he had gone missing. She had already called Larry's brother and some other family members and they were all searching around the area because little Tommy just wasn't there when she came down. But Tommy hadn't followed Larry on his jog and I couldn't find out at what point, but soon after the police were called and they tried to help find Tommy. The whole neighbourhood was helping, they were all sort of putting in what they could to try and look for the little boy, but someone who didn't seem immediately concerned was Larry, Tommy's father. So much so, his first instinct was to go in to get into the shower and then put on his sheriff's uniform because it was his day off. 
He claimed he didn't think the situation was serious enough and that Tommy would just turn up at any moment now. He even told people to go home and stop searching because it was snowing quite heavily. His fellow friends at the police department told him not to come in that day or for the next few days. I don't know why, I'm pretty sure because it's a common interest because it's his son so he's not allowed to work on the case. But he decided to ignore their instructions. And on that same day that Tommy first disappeared, he put on his uniform and he drove off in his patrol car, in his police car, because he was convinced that someone had abducted Tommy. Strangers had taken him from the garden and he was going to go out and try and find his son himself. He drove to local rest areas in the neighbourhood because there were loads of sort of woods and parks around these rest stops and he thought that Tommy might be there or he might be able to catch whoever took his son. Interestingly, Larry and Judith's neighbour across the road came forward two weeks after Tommy was missing and told police that they had seen a strange vehicle outside of the Gibson residence that day and they didn't think to mention it first when the police were there that day but they came forward two weeks later they said it was a gold slash bronze pickup truck and the license plate was actually in the back window of the car which obviously is not meant to be that's really sort of dodgy so they immediately noticed this um, and they didn't actually see people getting out of the car they didn't see Tommy being taken but they said that the car pulled up right in front of the Gibson house and they were walking past so they randomly decided to tell police this two weeks later. Karen, Larry and Judith's four-year-old daughter, also came forward around five weeks later and told Judith and Larry that she had seen her little brother being abducted by two strangers and she actually described a very similar vehicle. She said that she saw two grown adults come out, one woman with long blonde hair and a man with brown hair, a long beard and scruffy clothes. And she said that she physically saw them take Tommy from his garden and drive off with him. But again, she didn't originally tell police this on the first interviews of when Tommy went missing. She only decided to tell police this weeks later after confessing it to her mum and dad. So as we know, with missing persons cases, especially involving children, eight to nine times out of ten, the abductor is normally within the family or a close family friend. Um, obviously, stranger abductions do happen, but they are a lot less frequent. So the first lines of inquiries they had was to speak to Judith. And they actually found a lot of inconsistencies with, with Larry's chain of events. For some reason, Larry lied to the police about when he drove off that day when Tommy went missing, when he got in his patrol car and he drove off to go look for him. He didn't tell police that, but after they looked at his car, they found a lot of unaccounted for mileage. So they knew that he drove his car, so they were curious as to why. Um, so he then later admitted that he did drive the car to look for him, but he lied at first, so that's really weird. When Judith was questioned about this, she said that Larry only got in his car and drove away because he went to check on his private car somewhere, um, which I don't really understand what that means, but she was basically backing him up as to why he left that day and tried to give him um, some sort of cover. But I don't know why, because couldn't he have just admitted that he was going to look for his son? That's not going to be too weird considering his little boy has just gone missing. Um, just a side note, a lot of things in this case are quite confusing. Um, there's lots of different accounts. He sh There's lots of he said, she said. So I'm trying to read this as best as I can. This bit, which I find really interesting, is that Larry apparently went for a jog. And he jogged for two miles, which would have taken him exactly 47 minutes. But police somehow found out that he actually didn't go for that long. He only ran for about a mile, which would have taken 20 minutes, and then he would have came back and had an extra 25 minutes that were unaccounted for. And even stranger, when police scoped the area around the Gibson home, they actually did find a dead cat right outside of the home, but pushed away in the woods a bit. And this cat had been shot through the heart and the lungs. Sorry, animal lovers. Um, but he did shoot the cat, so police are just like, why is he lying about everything? 
At this point, police couldn't hold their tongue and they basically told Larry they strongly believe that Larry murdered Tommy. But what they said is that they believe that he accidentally murdered his son when he shot that cat. So they believe that as he went to shoot the stray cat, he did shoot the cat and Tommy maybe was behind the cat, ran in front of it and he accidentally shot his son. They believe that he wasn't aware at first, he went on his run, ran about a mile and then came back and saw his little boy dead and he completely panicked and he hid his body and that's what the other 20 minutes are unaccounted for. They believe that that's possibly why he drove his patrol car that morning because in them 20 minutes when he was cleaning up what he'd done, he placed his son in the patrol car's trunk or boot and then when he could, he quickly drove away and disposed of Tommy's body. So Larry outright denied this. He said that he had absolutely nothing to do with his son's disappearance. And he also reminded police that there were two eyewitness accounts of his son being abducted, one being the neighbor and one being his own daughter. It is also important to note that he did pass a lie detector test. I'm sure you're aware, but they're not very accurate. You can't use them in a court of law, but it's just something to note. But as for Karen, his four-year-old daughter, claiming that she did see strangers abduct Tommy, police believe that Larry was actually coaching her to say this in order to protect himself. And also, even though Judith did hear this shot that morning, she did say that she could hear Tommy playing in the garden after that. So that is all really confusing for me. So as I said, police were pretty certain that they thought Larry murdered his son. They were... 50-50, some thought that it was an accident and others thought that he purposely murdered his son that day. And they believe that the reason that he hid his son's body and didn't contact the police is because he was a well-respected man in the community. He was a deputy sheriff, you know, he had this whole, fa he had this whole family, this image, and he didn't want that image to be taken away from him. Again, Larry denied this, but then also said that the scenario was possible. Again, don't understand that. He later stated, though, that he was talking hypothetically. Again, though, it's just another big what the hell. Soon after Tommy vanished, investigators received a mysterious letter that was named Spot in the Road. That's literally all it said, Spot in the Road, and it was sent to investigators. They believed the author of this letter had vital information on Tommy's disappearance but it was later tracked down to be sent from this random woman who claimed to be a psychic and she said that she had a vision about what happened, but nothing ever came from this. And also the alleged couple who did, who allegedly took Tommy have never been identified and that vehicle has never been identified. Larry was officially the prime suspect in Tommy's disappearance, but convincing someone of murder without a body is almost impossible to do. So in the meantime, in January 1992, he quit his job as the county sheriff and the family packed up and they decided to move away and they moved to Montana where they wanted to start over. They also had another baby a few years later and named her Lisa. But Judith continued to support her husband's innocence and they strongly believed their son was taken. But you know what, I always find this weird, if they really believe that their son was abducted, why would you move house? Like, wouldn't you want to stay where you are in case your child ends up finding his way back and then he tries to come back to you and you don't live there anymore? I find that really suspicious because if they were that sure that he had been taken, why on earth would they move? It's almost like they knew he wasn't coming back, but I would save my thoughts and opinions for the end. Tommy's disappearance was featured on the very old version of Unsolved Mysteries and there was two full episodes on his disappearance but no leads were ever generated from the show which is odd as well. There's normally a few tips that come in but no one had anything to say or bring up or any sightings or anything. Shortly after the move in 1994, so three years after Tommy's dis disappearance, 
Larry and Judith actually separated. And the reason they separated is because Larry was later arrested on suspicion of the murder of his son. And this all came to light because Karen, who is now seven years old at the time, came forward to police and completely changed her story of what she said happened. So originally she said that she saw Tommy being abducted, but as she got older, somehow, for some reason, she changed her story. And what she said was, on that day, she was in her bedroom window looking down in the garden and she saw Larry beating Tommy. He held his little hands behind his back and started hitting him in the face. And apparently he did this until he passed out and then she saw him put Tommy's body in a black bin bag and take it to the trunk of his patrol car. She then hid in her wardrobe because she was so scared of what she'd witnessed and apparently Larry saw her so he went up to her bedroom and basically said you need to lie and tell the police and tell everyone that you saw Tommy being taken by strangers and if you don't I will kill you and the reason she didn't tell police this is because he obviously threatened her and she was scared. Also after Judith and Larry separated she ended up also coming forward and telling police that he was physically abusive to her and all of her children including Lisa the newest member of the family and she also admitted that she was too scared to come to police at the time. Larry's half sister also admitted that back in that year of 1991 he called her crying his eyes out and conf confessed to her that he did accidentally kill Tommy. But I find it really odd that this all comes out years later. Um, again we'll get to my theories at the end of the video but I found that really odd how they were completely back in here up until this point and then when they separated they all come out with all this information so although there has not been a body found of tommy gibson the police felt that they had enough circumstantial evidence to arrest larry so in a march of 1995 they arrested him and a jury decided that he was guilty of second degree manslaughter and was also charged for abusing a child which to me manslaughter suggests that police thought that it was an accidental death or the jury sorry decided on an accidental death because he was originally taken in for the murder of his son but the jury came to the agreement that it was manslaughter which is a completely different charge in itself with a much lower sentence so that's also really interesting to me but as I said, there's never been a body found. It's very, very hard to convict someone of murder without a body. It hasn't been done that many times because you need that body to be found as evidence that this person has actually passed away. And over 30 years later, we still don't have that evidence. Again, really interesting, the media has continued to release age progression photos. They released one of what he'd look like at 16 or 19 and one at what Tommy would look like at 24. So if the police were sure that he was dead and that he was killed, why are they still releasing missing persons photos and age progression photos? Who would be looking for this person if they allegedly are dead so because he was charged with second degree manslaughter he was only sentenced to three years in prison but only ended up serving one year and was released on good behavior in september of 1996 which is crazy like what is even the point point? and get this now larry gibson is living in montana and he's pursuing a career as a country singer just chilling with his guitar singing songs after all of this stuff has happened crazy and he continues to claim his innocence he has never admitted that he did anything to his son and he he won't and he also set up a facebook page in 2001 called find tommy gibson as has continued to spread the word on his son a really important element, an interesting element of this case is that Tommy's face was featured in a MTV music video by a band called Soul Asylum and it was in their single Runaway Train. Um, it's quite old but I'd never heard of it but this song is basically uh, a music video and it has the faces of 36 missing kids at the time and it has like a short video or a short picture on 
the child and their name, their age, where they went missing. And it plays consistently throughout the song. So 36 children. And interestingly enough, since 2021, 24 of them children have been found. So that's a huge chunk of the children. And of course, none other than Tommy Gibson is featured in this video. Okay, so now I'm just gonna quickly get into my thoughts and opinions on this case, because I realised in my other ones, I do give my opinion a lot, I can't help it, I'm passionate about these these cases and I need to say what I think, you know, you're welcome to agree with me, you're welcome to disagree with me, but I love having conversations with you guys in the comments to talk about what we think and I always learn something new from one of you, so I think this is important to do. Okay, so my first point is, why are you letting a literal baby play outside on his own, a two and a half year old playing outside on his own in the snow? I know it was a different time, maybe that's it, 1991, but still, I think that's that's crazy. I think that's almost like neglect. Like, why are you gonna let a two-year-old play by themselves outside without someone watching him? Anyway, second point is, why was Judith at first completely backing up uh, Larry and saying that she heard Tommy playing after the shot and that he didn't have anything to do with it and that he only left that day to go check on his private car? She completely backed him up, had another baby with him, and then they separated years later and all of this started coming out. So I know, obviously, she may have been in an abusive, manipulative, controlling relationship, and maybe she didn't feel like she could speak out at first. But even so, if you actually thought your husband had murdered your baby, he's two, and you're going to just stick with him and, you know, back him up anyway, what sort of mother are you? I'm sorry, but you would speak out, I don't think you'd care, I think you would speak out, if you're a decent person, you still speak out and say, at the beginning, I think he did something to my son, I don't know, debatable, and uh, my main thought is, I'm pretty sure that Larry killed Tommy, but there isn't really any evidence, guys, do you know what I mean, there isn't really any evidence, there's the eyewitness account of Karen, who was four at the time, you know, I'm not saying she's lying at all, but I, again, I just find, find it all really interesting how it came out. And like, also, if you're a policeman, like, why are you going to murder a child in your front garden in broad daylight? I find that a bit weird. I feel like if you were going to do it, then why wouldn't you do it like inside or somewhere else? I think that's pretty risky for a police officer to make. And probably my biggest thing that I don't understand is that if the police believed he was dead, then why were missing persons, posters and age progression photos being released for years and years after? Can someone actually explain that to me? Because I don't get that at all. That's like I said at the beginning, it's kind of like they, they're saying that he was murdered, but he's still classed as a missing person. So I just don't get that, how he can be... Like, they're saying, I'll keep an eye out for him. Like, remember him, you know, look look out for him. He may look like this now. He may look like that now. And it's like, but you charged someone basically with murder. I know it was manslaughter, but, like, you basically charged someone with, with, with murder because manslaughter is just when you accidentally kill someone. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, but I found this one really, really interesting. Really interesting. And I'd love to hear your guys' comments. What do you think? Um, yeah. So, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Obviously, um, an awful, awful case. So sad. Um, he was such a sweet little boy. He had his whole life ahead of him. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to tell his story today. So, yeah, let's catch up in the comments. And I will see you on the next one. Take care. Bye.